So, huh, that image that you just saw, taken December 24th, 1968. 500 years ago, when this olive tree began its life, the first circumnavigation of the world was undertaken by Magellan and his crew. Just imagine, 50 years ago, the first circumnavigation of the moon, where the young Bill Anders, the astronaut, looked out the window and saw this. It was during the Apollo 8, making figure eights around the moon, back and around the moon. They did it eight times. But because the young Bill Anders convinced NASA that he should take a camera with a long lens, thinking that they wanted to take images of the moon to discover the moon. But he said, we set out to discover the moon, but the far side of the moon that no one had seen before. But what they really discovered was this, the Earth, a transformative view of ourselves from high in the sky. Think of it, until about that time, although we imagined what Earth looked like from far away, getting the human perspective from the far side of the moon, coming around and watching this, Earth rise, it just changed everything. It was a catalyst that made all that we care about seem suddenly very, very vulnerable, fragile in the great vastness of the universe. This is the only place where life is known to exist. And absolutely for sure, it's the only place that is like this. It has taken four and a half billion years to transform molten rock, the early Earth, into what we know and love now as our home. Imagine, as we look into the universe and think about where is there some other place where we could set up housekeeping, <laughs> where we could have civilization, where we could escape from the problems here on Earth. Mars is the most likely place. But the atmosphere of Mars today is very thin. A little bit of carbon dioxide may be enough to break the carbon from the oxygen to get oxygen for us to be able to breathe. But just think of how long it has taken for life on the blue planet to split what the basic elements are from carbon dioxide and water to create an atmosphere and food, the magic process of photosynthesis without which we would not be here. But tiny little microbes, bacteria, somehow came up with a process of photosynthesis about three billion years ago. So for the first, oh, what, half billion? Maybe as much as a billion years, there was life on Earth, but photosynthesis didn't exist. Microbes were here. Chemosynthesis. They existed. They produced food out of the rocks that sustained them. But photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water, yields food, simple sugar, and as a byproduct, oxygen gets spun off. Aren't we lucky? <laughs> The rest of life as we know it now prospers in part because of chemosynthesis, but because of photosynthesis. It was only, though, about half a billion years ago when there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere to enable large creatures to begin to really flourish in the ocean, mostly in the ocean, and ultimately on land. It's so easy for us to think of history in terms of us, ourselves, our own human history. To think about where did we come from? Who are we? 
Well, we should think of our long ago ancestors, the microbes that started the whole process, that now here we are, <laughs> lucky us. We still have a lot of mi microbes within us, something that we just didn't really think about or even know about until fairly recently. Microbes rule, shaping the chemistry of the planet, shaping the chemistry of life. It's taken a long time to get from rocks and ultimately rocks and water to what we think of and tend to take for granted as a livable planet. With the, now, the atmosphere, about 20% oxygen. Most of the rest of it is nitrogen, also generated from the rocks that were initially that fireball that was Earth many gazillions of years ago. Just enough carbon dioxide to power photosynthesis. A little bit of, of helium, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but mostly it's nitrogen and 20% oxygen. Just right for us. So in the earlier discussion here, there's comments about let's go to Mars or let's not go to Mars. Elon Musk says he'd like to send 50,000 people to Mars by the end of the century. Well, good luck with that. I'd like to make my list. Do you have your list of those you'd like to send to Mars? <laughs> <laughs> I think setting up a colony elsewhere is not a bad idea, but can you imagine trying to ship 7 billion people or 8 billion or 10 billion to another place? Not likely. Not in our lifetime, not in any, I mean, it really would be smart. Maybe it would be wise for us to look at what we've got right here. And it isn't just the basic ingredients that we have, it's a living planet. And it's taken a long time to get it to where it is. It'll take a long time to take any other place that we know about to make it barely livable. I mean, we take so much for granted here, including the microbes that live within us, each one of us. We have our own special brand of microbes. Each of us is an ecosystem, but that's true of every other living thing, including trees with microbes and fungi in their roots that make their lives possible. We're just learning so much so fast about the interconnectedness of all of us with all of the rest of nature. Yes, water is the key to life. As some of the exobiologists are fond of saying, those who are looking for life elsewhere beyond this planet, that the single non-negotiable thing that life requires is water. And if you want to find life elsewhere in the universe, what do you look for? Water. Water is key at least for life as we know it. But it's so much more than rocks and water. It is about the little guys that shape those rocks, shape the water. Water, it's hard to find just pure water out of a laboratory, outside of a laboratory. If there's water out in the natural world, there's stuff growing in it. <laughs> it's almost unavoidable. What looks like pure ocean water has millions of bacteria and other organisms there. It might look perfectly clear, but if you really get down to the basics, it isn't just hydrogen and oxygen it's a, and salt. It's a lot of other things as well. Curiously, it's taking us a long time to value life in the ocean as the key to our existence. But the evidence is, is there. It wasn't until 1986 that a scientist from MIT, Penny Chisholm and her colleagues, discovered an organism called Prochlorococcus. If you do not know the word Prochlorococcus, it's one that you should put into your vocabulary and say, thank you, Prochlorococcus. Even though we did not know you existed before 1986, our existence is largely dependent because of your existence 
on the order of 20% of the oxygen in the atmosphere as well as in the ocean is generated by these tiny little cells that are so small it took a new technique that was initiated back in 1986 to discover that it exists. It's the tiniest single-celled organism that we know about, at least, on the planet. And it does the heavy lifting, along with diatoms, along with coccolithophorids, and other microscopic photosynthetic organisms. Now, we say thank you rainforests. Some call them the lungs of the planet. Well, they do generate oxygen. And they do extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But most of what we breathe is a result of photosynthesis out there in the ocean. We need it all. I mean, what part of the planet, what part of our spacecraft can we just throw away? What part of an aircraft that you're flying in the hostile atmosphere of wherever it is? Would you chop off the wings? Would you throw a piece out of the engine? What part of it would you not think is necessary? It's taken a long time to get Earth just right for us, four and a half billion years. It's taken us about four and a half decades to chop up, throw away, disrupt, change the chemistry, change the temperature, destroy much of the wildlife the animals, the plants, the microbes that make our lives possible. It's something we don't think about very much. Most people don't. But we should be riveted <laughs> at knowing what keeps us alive and looking at the trends, the decline of those photosynthesizers in the ocean. About 40% since the middle of the 20th century it's just not there. Our engine, that is, that generates oxygen, takes up carbon in the ocean, is on a downhill slide. Did we cause that? Well, temperature change is part of it. Changing the chemistry of the planet, of the ocean, is part of what is believed to be that. Changing the food webs in the ocean may also be responsible, in part. We don't know for sure, but we do know that we're really good at clear-cutting forests on the land. And in a sense, we're doing the same thing, clear-cutting these miniature forests in the ocean. So little green things power the small animals. Zooplankton shown here, tiny little jellyfish, a cross-section of many of the forms of life that occur here on the planet. There are about 35 or so major divisions of animal life. We are among the group called chordates that include the vertebrates, include birds and turtles and fish and things, but we occupy a little narrow segment of the diversity of life on Earth. Most of them are invertebrates. Most of them are small, and nearly all of them occur in the ocean. About half of the major divisions of animal life occur on all of the land put together. I mean, there are just so many creatures out there that most people don't have a chance to get to meet because we are very terrestrial. We're air breathers. You have to get out there, down there, get wet, or get into a submarine or something of this sort to really appreciate that most of life on Earth is out there in the ocean both in terms of diversity, by weight, by numbers, you name it. It isn't just that the Earth is covered on the order of whatever it is, 70% by water. It's a three-dimensional world. And because life as we know it requires water on this planet, most of the water, 97%, is ocean. It's no surprise to realize that 97% of the living space where life occurs, it's out there in the blue part of the planet. We're the odd ones, we terrestrial creatures. Earth is an ocean planet. Earth is a living planet. Most of the life is out there in not just the surface, not just the beautiful sunlit coral reef area, but 
think of the average depth. Average depth is four kilometers, the maximum 11 kilometers. And it's only in fairly recent times that we have confirmed that it's alive from the surface all the way down. There's no place in the ocean where there's water, where life does not occur. And it's in constant motion, the, the changing the, the chemistry. It's an eat and be eaten world out there. It's like Wall Street. You know? But the big guys eat the smaller guys, eat the, and so on down to you finally get to those little jewel-like green things. It's amazing, but every step of the way, somebody's eating somebody else and they're putting nutrients back into the system that ultimately power prochlorococcus and diatoms and coccolithophorids and all that other stuff that generates oxygen and captures carbon, shapes planetary chemistry and keeps us alive as well as the rest of life on Earth. It's really great to get out in the middle of the ocean and watch food chains in action as long as you don't become a part of it. Here, you see sharks and dolphins and birds on the surface. What you don't see are the tiny little guys, the power plants, the green energizers that are generating oxygen, taking up carbon, developing the basic sugar that becomes those small organisms that ultimately wind up as tuna and sharks and whales. And, and us. So, when I began diving years ago, I was told, oh, what are you thinking, going in the water, you're going to get eaten by a shark. It was man-eaters that they were concerned about. And those of you who have seen or read the book Jaws know that it terrified humans everywhere. But then I thought, I don't qualify if they're just man-eaters out there. I mean, half the world's population were, you know, female, so no worries. But actually, we don't have to worry about getting eaten by sharks, whether you're male or female. It's sharks needing to worry about getting eaten by us. We take millions of sharks, some for food, some for products, some just for their fins to make a luxury meal. Shark fin soup. Think of it. Sharks have been around as top predators in the ocean for on the order of more than 300 million years. And along come primates, terrestrial creatures now, that have brought their numbers across the board down to from where they were when I began exploring the ocean in the 1950s to, well, some species fewer than 10%. Some are down to just 1%. Others, you know, we ignore them because they're small and deep sea. They're faring better. But to see these creatures that are so successful for so many millions of years to be brought down cataclysmically in decades well, that's a sign of our power, I suppose, but you could also say it's a sign of our ignorance. Not knowing how important sharks, tunas, swordfish, whales, all the creatures in the sea are to this functioning of the chemistry of the planet that results in the air we breathe, the climate that is suitable for us, tuna. I have heard engineers at MIT sigh with envy when they look at a tuna. They try to replicate how a tuna moves through the ocean, capturing 90%, more than that, 97% of the energy that they generate when they move their tail back and forth. Little whirlpools are captured, and the energy just enables them to fly through the water as fast as a nuclear submarine. I mean, big jet through the ocean. They can't do it forever, but they do have to renew their energy supply. And to do so, they dive down where there's a layer of life called the deep scattering layer that starts during the daytime. You'll find it 
in ocean almost everywhere at about 100 meters. It extends down to as deep as 1,000 meters. But it's largely ignored because people are up here in their boats. They look at the sky, from the sky, look down, you don't see this layer of life. It is composed mostly of small fish with lights down their side, lantern fish with lures down in their nose, jellyfish, crustaceans. But it, the tunas know about this layer of life beneath the surface of the ocean that comes up at night to feed and then descends back by day to lurk below the surface. The largest animal migration on the planet is this daily migration up and down where large creatures in the sea, tunas, swordfish, turtles, whales, get their groceries when they're out there in the open sea. So humans, again, we have come along in recent times and decided that tuna should be on our menu. And as with sharks, their numbers have gone from here, <laughs> when I began exploring the ocean, to a fraction of what they were. Bluefin tuna, yellowfin tuna, skipjack tuna, a whole range of tuna species have succumbed to the technologies that enable us now to find them, capture them, and market them, and consume them, wildlife, on an industrial scale, unlike anything that the planet has ever known in such a short time to cause what ocean scientists are calling the defaunation, the, the extraction of life from the sea on a scale unprecedented. I mean, it took us 10,000 years from the time when we were, our numbers were small. In fact, it took until 500 years ago before there were half a billion of us. The time of Magellan. Going way back 10,000 years ago, you could number our species not just in the, in the billions or half billions, we were in the thousands, but we have succeeded by consuming the natural world. But it took us 10,000 years to eliminate many of the creatures that we now only know from fossils. It's taking us a few decades to eliminate much of the wildlife from the sea. Now, sharks are not yet extinct. No tuna has yet gone extinct. But their numbers are so precariously low that we could cause the extinction of swordfish. We know how to kill them, and we know how to cook them. The same was true with whales. We had the technology to kill the last whale, if we wanted to, but we chose not to. In 1986, the same year Prochlorococcus was discovered, that was the year nations came together. I was on the whaling commission for four years, debating the fate of whales. Uh, could we, should we stop killing them altogether? Was in the 1980s, that was a, a kind of a global discussion, recognizing that they have social structure, they have families, they have language. It's like there are other nations out there. Should we just cook them up and use them as pounds of meat, barrels of oil? The biggest brain, brains on the planet belong to the animals that you see sliced and diced here, sperm whales in an Australian whaling factory before the moratorium on the commercial killing of whales came into effect. The biggest brain on the planet. They live at least as long as humans. They have these amazing social structures. We have learned so much so fast but what we don't know is what we've lost because we killed so many of them before we began to ask the right questions. What we now are beginning to discover is how valuable these creatures are alive versus how valuable they are used once, cooked, and consumed 
as products, one way or the other. So, huh, same is true with tuna. Engineers look at tuna and say, oh, I wish I could do what they do. How can we learn from them their secrets? How can we learn from whales what whales know that we can't know because we are not equipped as they are to go deep in the ocean, to travel over thousands of miles with no road map, like getting lunch along the way by diving down to the deep scattering layer. How much are we losing about this library of knowledge of life in this miracle planet that we occupy, along with all these other creatures, because we see them first and foremost as something to eat or something to turn into barrels of oil or pounds of fertilizer or whatever. We look at wildlife as a source of for our immediate purposes. We're beginning to see what we could not see when I was a child. When I was a child, whaling was a quite respectable endeavor. And, and I don't blame the, the whalers or the fishers of the past for what they took in not knowing the importance of life in the ocean or the belief that there's nothing we could possibly do that could, could diminish the abundance of life in the sea. Or even if we did eliminate whales, so what? What difference would it make to us, we who live on the land, not knowing until fairly recently how everything connects, how what happens in the ocean in one part of the planet affects the whole planet. What happens on the fires in the forests of Indonesia affect the whole planet. We are beginning for the first time, for the first time in all the history of humankind, to really see how things fit together. And it's still really imperfect. But we know enough to know that we should be cautious of what we do to the natural system that keeps us alive. We did not know burning fossil fuels to power civilization could possibly have a downside when it began in the middle of the 20th century, really started to take off. And we all should be grateful to fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas, because it's given us lights. It's given us the power to come together here. It's given us the ability to go high in the sky and look back on Earth and see ourselves in perspective. We have communication, we have health systems, we have so much that has come about in recent decades because of burning through millions of years of sunlight gathered together as coal, oil, and gas. But probably the most important thing that those fossil fuels have given us is the knowledge huh, that now we have to change, now we know. We understand what we could not see when I was a child, what none of us could, not just <laughs> in the 20th century, go, go back. The smartest people who ever lived could not know what 10-year-olds of today have access to with a system of communication, of putting knowledge out there so that it's accessible, not just in libraries, not just in scrolls, not just in word of mouth, but we all have the power, superpower, of knowing that which was unknowable. Even Einstein did not know what Earth looked like from space, did not know what it was like in the deepest part of the ocean. Huh, today, only three times have people descended to the deepest part of the ocean. Only three times, first in 1960, most recently, just this past year. James Cameron made a descent in 2012, catching little glimpses of what it's like 11 kilometers beneath the surface of the ocean. Now we know because of fossil fuels, we've got satellites, we've got astronauts up in the sky, we've got instruments powered by fossil fuels that enable us to see how the world is changing, changing rapidly, more rapidly than at any time that we know about in prior history, Earth history, except perhaps when a comet, boom, struck the Earth about 65 million years ago and changed everything. 
But we are the agents of change, altering climate, altering weather, altering planetary chemistry, altering the composition of life on Earth through our actions. Now we can see what was unseeable, unknowable, how the dusts of the Sahara can go be blown across the Atlantic Ocean and wind up carrying the spores of fungi to the reefs in the Caribbean Sea, or duck, they go all the way across North America and land in parts of the Pacific, how everything connects with everything else. Just as in the skies above, the ocean too has the equivalent of the wind, the currents that move, that carry the nutrients, that move carbon dioxide, that move oxygen, move nitrogen, move creatures, the pathways of turtles, the pathways of sharks and tunas, and other creatures know these pathways in the sea. Now cluttered with things that we put into the sea. This is again new in our time. I come from the pre-plasticozoic, before these ingredients that we remarkably have synthesized to our benefit. I mean, I dare say most of us are wearing something or using something made of a synthetic material that does not occur in nature, made possible because of our ability to generate things that we could not generate before. And it, these, these plastic synthetic materials have served us so well. But now we know the downside. And it's coming upon us like an avalanche all at once. Plastics in the ocean, plastics in the water we drink, plastics in the food we consume. Where is this heading? Nobody knows for sure except that it doesn't bode well for us, and it certainly does not bode well for life in the ocean. On the order of hundreds, not just hundred, but hundreds of thousands of marine creatures either engulf or get wrapped up in plastic debris that have as its source us. It breaks up into little pieces, of course, and ultimately it gets to be so small that it's hard to imagine how to retrieve those bits and pieces from where we have tossed them. So plastics are not a bad thing. It's just what we do with them when we're through with them and not thinking through the consequences of something that seems like such a good idea when we start out. So armed with knowledge, which is a key to solving problems, you can't solve a problem if you don't know you've got one, We've got a whole list of problems that now face us. But imagine if we did not know that the planet is warming, that we did not know that Greenland ice is melting, that we did not know, could not measure, did not have evidence, have evidence that sea level is inexorably not just rising, because it's been rising since the height of the last ice age as the planet generally has become warm, but we have accelerated the warming. We can measure it. We can look at the source. We can define the cause. That's a great start in terms of being able to solve the problem. Polar bears cannot so solve that problem. Elephants don't know what to do, even if they knew what the problems were. It's up to us. We are the super creatures on Earth. We can see the problems that we have caused. We can see the consequences, not just to other animals, but back to us. Why should we care if half the coral reefs on the planet have disappeared or are in a state of sharp decline, owing largely to the warming of the planet, causing the loss of the colorful organisms that live in association with the corals, the little algae that live in the tissues, that when it gets too warm, they escape, and you get what is known as coral bleaching. It looks like a snowfield. 
But if we didn't know, if we didn't have eyes in the ocean, if we didn't know the connections between the diversity of life in coral reefs, the food chains in the sea, the generation of oxygen, the, for the taking up of carbon dioxide, uh, why should we care? Except that maybe it's, it's beautiful aesthetically, but now we know, as you might see in this image of the great barrier reef as it was, as it was not so long ago. You could dive there. You could even snorkel there. You didn't have to go far below the surface to see this amazingly diverse, rich cross-section of life in an area you can embrace with your arms. You could find 20 phyla, the major divisions of life on Earth, more than occur on all of the terrestrial parts of the planet put together. The ocean is such an amazing cornucopia of life. Well, OK, go back more recently. And it's heartbreaking to know that a place that is so rich and so diverse, so thriving, so important to life in the sea, and you look at the full circle back to us, then you will care and you will want to do something about it. Why don't we care? Well, here's part of the reason, I suppose. Most of what we know about the ocean throughout all of our history of exploring the planet has come from the surface. The Challenger expedition that began in 1872, four years of scientists going around the world with a specific mission of trying to figure out as much as they could, everything they could about the ocean, using the best instruments that were available at the time. Well, they did not have GPS, so going back to the exact same places that the, those scientists explored is a little tricky. They did discover a lot of things that we are now rediscovering, but using techniques that meant lowering instruments down, or dragging nets, or hooks, or whatever. OK, so imagine you're Jane Goodall, and you want to study these creatures in the forest. And you're equipped with standard oceanographic techniques. You're flying over the forest. You can't get into the forest unless you go down in a submarine, or if you dive in, but you have a limited time to really get to know the creatures on the land the way we have come to know them has taken hours, days, weeks, months, years of careful looking, of getting to know individuals, to getting to know behaviors. In the ocean, it's trickier. You know, if you are wearing scuba, you have a passport, you can go down 100 feet. You can go down 50 meters for a short time, and you have to go back up. Or you have to decompress to allow the gas that you've accumulated in your system, the nitrogen, to gradually escape. Now, there are ways and means, and I've had the pleasure of doing this 10 times, living underwater, staying not just for a few minutes or an hour or two, but to stay underwater day and night for a week, two weeks, to sleep with a fish, to be there through the full 24-hour cycle, and to be able to stay not just inside and look out the window, the way most astronauts do in the sky, but to actually get outside and, and to be able to communicate with those on the surface. Imagine this is Jane Goodall trying to study her chimpanzees on their own terms. I mean, it's really amazing that we know as much as we do about the creatures in the sea, given the techniques that we have to apply. I mean, we don't have gills. If we did, we could go and swim with the fish, stay with them, be a part of a school of fish, dive down with a tuna when they go to the deep scattering layer to feed, and really get to know them. Even so, what we have learned in the recent decades is that just as all of us 
just as every chimpanzee, every cat, every dog, every horse, every fish has a face. Every fish has its own DNA, has its own system of microbes, we suspect. We just haven't been able to get to know them, except on our plate, knowing, like, mmm, delicious. <laughs> but once you have encountered them and get to see them, and respect them for reasons other than how good they taste, somehow the attitude changes. I mean, it's, people will consume mammals, wild birds, fish from the sea, but perhaps with more respect, more dignity than we currently give them. <laughs> Even the biggest fish in the sea, whale sharks, have individual patterns of spots, and we know this now <laughs> because of computer mo uh, models. You can take a photograph of the side of every whale shark and submit it to Whale Shark Central, where they have a computer system that enables you to tell which whale shark you have just photographed. Many of them have names, and we know where they've been traveling. And it's really pretty exciting to get to know individual creatures in the sea with some of the same kind of respect that we have begun to accord some of the creatures, some of the birds that have names that we can migrate over long distance, know who that bird is, who that fish is, who that wolf is, who the elephant is. Individuals somehow makes a difference in terms of how we regard life in the ocean. When you think of them as, I don't know, Sam or Peter, school of fish, no, a school of individuals, each one with a place. And when you take them out of the ocean, you've left a space. You've broken the chain. You've altered the nature of life in the sea. And we have done so much of this so fast, it's no wonder that the chemistry of the planet is changing. It would be astonishing to think that it, that it didn't make a difference. Well, there are a few individuals few kinds of creatures that have a magnified significance, I suppose, in the greater scheme of life. A whole class of arthropods is known by only four species. Horseshoe crabs, valuable in medical science because they're used the blood of these creatures. You drain the blood out of horseshoe crabs to use for certain kinds of important testing. Now we know how to it has been discovered how to synthesize a material that does the job, but thousands, hundreds of thousands of horseshoe crabs are taken every year for two reasons. One, to get the eggs to use for bait, to get eels that can be sent from North America to China. The other, to drain the blood out of them for the medical testing. These creatures, have been around much longer than sharks, at least 400 million years. But on our watch, our watch, our time, their numbers have gone from here, when I was a kid, to a fraction of what they were. This pattern is repeated over and over and over. Maybe you've seen the headlines. We're poised to lose a million species at least. Maybe we've already lost that many in our time on our watch in ignorance of knowing just how many species there are in the soil, in the sky, in the forests, in the coral reefs, in the deep sea. Another category, squids and octopuses. You know, out of all the many kinds of creatures there are, there are half a million kinds of insects. There are 9,000 kinds of birds. There are only a few hundred kinds of squids and octopuses. And we're just beginning to keep, as we go deeper, find out not only new species, but how they live, what role they play. But one thing we do know about squid and octopus is how they taste. Huh. That we know. We're really good at capturing wildlife from the ocean and preparing it for our consumption. Even these creatures, who have some of the most remarkable eyes on the planet. These are creatures, you can find them in the Tokyo fish market, you can see them in markets in Key West, 
they're shrimpy creatures. They're crustaceans, but they're not like shrimp in your shrimp cocktail, although they're pretty special creatures too. The eyes of stomatopods can see a range of light like this, including ultraviolet. We can see, by comparison, about this much. And wouldn't you like to get inside of them and see what they see? To be a mantis shrimp, a stomatopod for a little while, just to see the world through their eyes? Or do you just want to see how good they taste? Lemon slices and butter. I mean, maybe there's a place for both, but the way we're going, consuming ocean wildlife as if it will never run out, which it is running out, there's some things we will never know if we don't just give these creatures a break soon. So, the ways and means of getting into the ocean. I've tried all kinds of things. A diving suit like, you can go down to 1,000 feet. Little submarines. I love submarines. I wish all of you loved submarines and would make it a priority to, you know, your bucket list. Oh, I want to get into a submarine and explore the ocean. I want to go below the surface. I want to see what life is like in the dark except not totally dark because bioluminescence, that firefly kind of light, illuminates the deep sea. Below a thousand feet or so, it's dark all of the time. And it's cold. Even in the tropics, if at a thousand feet, it's really cold. And if you go all the way down to the deepest part of the ocean, it's not freezing, but it's cold, dark, high pressure. For us, inhospitable. But we can get there. We have the technology to be able to take ourselves down to appreciate what is in the deep sea for the first time in our history, to explore this planet, this blue planet, and to respect it and take care of it because our lives really depend on it. We didn't know. We thought the ocean was too big to fail. I always thought that because I was told that when I was a kid. It doesn't matter if we lose the whales. Eh, you know, they're, they're cool animals and it would be a shame to lose them, but life will go on as before. But now we're beginning to see the importance of the ocean and life in the ocean to our existence. So I've had the great pleasure of using more than 30 different kinds of submarines and sharing the view with kids, with the head of National Geographic, with teachers, a five-year project with the National Geographic to look around the coastline of the United States. I'd love to do this around the world, building new submersibles so easy to drive that even a scientist can do it, so that you can do it. You could have Hertz, rent a sub, or whatever. You can have one in your own garage to be able to take yourself into the depths. You know, this is not science fiction. This is science, technology in action right now. The technology exists to go to the deepest part of the ocean. What's lacking is the will, just as the will to take care of the ocean because we have this notion that it doesn't matter what happens to life in the sea. We have new technologies, remotely operated vehicles such as this, drones. We know about drones that have all come about in recent times. Drones, their equivalent in the ocean, exploring, mapping. We are powered with knowledge that should electrify us about doing what it takes right now to take care of the natural world, land and sea, that makes our existence possible. So I met this bird not long ago halfway across the Pacific Ocean. She has been named Wisdom by the people who know her. She was banded in the 1950s. She began to fly at about the same time that I was learning how to dive. So we've had this parallel view of the world. She, from her perch out in the Pacific, flying out thousands of miles to capture squid and small fish to bring back to the single chick that she and her lifelong mate raise every year. She has no doubt noticed 
that there are more, there's more traffic out in the ocean, fewer fish, fewer squid, lots of plastic stuff, not knowing what it is or where it came from. We know. She cannot know what we know. And even if she did, like the elephants <laughs> or the polar bears, they're sharing this experience of an unprecedented planet in change, in a time of change, but not knowing the cause and not knowing to, what to do to fix the decline of things that once were prosperous. But things are also moving in the right direction. I was witness to the time when President George W. Bush, with a stroke of his pen, designated the largest area of the ocean, the largest area, larger than any of the areas on the land, larger than all the national parks put together, um, for protection. And it's the island group, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, Papahana Makuakea Marine Reserve, where wisdom, the albatross, and other albatrosses and other seabirds exist, where sharks exist, tunas come. Anyway, that was in the last part of his administration. So even though George W. Bush was not notable for his environmentally sensitive decisions, this one sort of redeemed him. And it was probably because of Laura Bush, who's there in the pink suit, who advised him of the wisdom of this protection. But then, boom, along comes President Obama and quadruples the size of that same part of the Pacific. And we're on a roll because here is the president of Palau, my dive buddy. Palau is a little island in the Pacific, but it has this big exclusive economic zone also declared in the 1980s when nations around the world extended their reach out into the sea. France has one of the largest exclusive economic zones on the planet owing to offshore islands and, of course, the coastline of the country itself. Little Palau is a tiny little bit of land and a lot of ocean. And like other island nations around the world, this one, Palau, under the President Tommy Vermingosel's leadership, has declared 80% of it as a fully protected area where even the squid and the whales and the tunas and the sharks have a safe haven. So with the actions that are now happening in Chile, another president who dives and who pilots aircraft has decided to use his power, as his predecessor did as well recently, to declare as much as 40% of their exclusive economic zone for protection. In 2016, the largest area of the ocean protected was around Antarctica, the Ross Sea Marine Reserve, where even little shrimpy things, the krill, the cornerstone of the Antarctic food chain, are at least in that area, have a safe place. But when you take all of these good moves and put them in together, how much of the ocean is safe for tunas and squid and all the creatures who naturally live there who were safe totally until humans came along, mostly in the 20th century as we measure time? Well, it's somewhere between 3 and 5%, closer to 3% is declared by our, <laughs> by our hand to be safe. The rest of it's open to fishing. The rest is open to exploit. So the high seas, the area beyond national jurisdiction, is an opportunity that now faces the world. That's half of the world beyond national jurisdiction. It's that big blue part. There's a little place around each of the continents that is exclusive economic zone that nations have declared that we primates, we humans, we terrestrial creatures have declared that as for our use. But half of the world is under nobody's jurisdiction, or everyone's. 
It's the global commons, currently up for grabs. What we're seeing right now is this awareness of beginning to understand the ocean drives climate, the ocean drives weather, the ocean shapes planetary chemistry, the ocean generates most of the oxygen in the atmosphere. The ocean is where most of life on Earth actually lives. The ocean is in trouble, and therefore, we should listen up. So an organization that I started 10 years ago with the purpose of trying to ignite public awareness and support for protecting the ocean by identifying key areas and to use our power. And of course, working with presidents and ministers and those with mighty powers to be able to declare protection the way Tommy Romingasau has done in Palau and the way President Bush did for the United States and President Obama. But coastal communities, people everywhere can identify places they know and love and endow them with hope. Call them hope spots, working with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN. There are now a list of more than 100 places that people have nominated for protection with the hope that they can influence decision makers to really go from where we are now with maybe three, four, five percent of the ocean protected where even the fish are safe, <laughs> to maybe something like half the world, the high seas, you could do it in a stroke. You could just give us an insurance policy, a place where oxygen can be generated, carbon can be captured, that something that will help forestall the decline of the planetary processes that we have always taken for granted until just about now. Here are two of my four particular hope spots, my four grandsons, because as you heard, you've heard it several times in the discussion, it's the kids coming along with fresh perspective, armed with knowledge that could not exist when I was a kid. They don't know that it's not possible. Of course, whatever it is that we want to make happen has a possibility of coming true if we work toward those goals, knowing that the problems are we can solve the problems if we pull together to, to see what, what keeps us alive. Don't you want to know? Don't you want to know what air is and where it comes from? How did, it, how did Earth get to be what it is? And looking at the evidence, in such a short time on our watch, we have witnessed, we have been causing this. We know that protecting nature has to be a priority. Where else are we going to go? We can look at the stars and dream of another place where we can lift off and move because we've done such terrible things to this planet. Or we can look here, right here, under our feet, out into the ocean, armed with knowledge that is unprecedented, and say, we are the luckiest people ever to have arrived on Earth because we have this power of knowing that leads to caring, that can lead to action, that can lead by the end of this century. <laughs> we have to start right now to do what it takes to take care of the blue that makes our existence possible. Thank you.